It's my pleasure uh, to introduce Paul Lewis today. So Gabe asked me to, to fill in, which is, you know, big shoes to fill. So to, today I'm introducing Paul. Um, he's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a principal at LTL Architects in New York. Uh, and of course, a, a professor at Princeton University in the School of Architecture. Um, his New York-based uh, firm has completed academic, institutional, and residential uh, and hospitality projects throughout the United States. They received numerous awards, including a National Design Award and multiple American Institute of Architects Design Awards. Uh, their recent work, built work, uh, include the Upson Hall at Cornell University, uh, the Contemporary Austin Art Center in Austin, um, and other uh, many different things. Um, some of the designs and drawings are uh, exhibited around the world, including um, at the US Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale, um, and are part of the permanent collection of several museums, including the Museum of Modern Art, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Carnegie Museum of Art. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that their uh, newest book, um, which I'm not gonna say what it talks about, but... <laughs> Uh, was selected by um, as one of the 10 best architecture books of the year by the Dutch Architecture Museum. Um, it is, Paul is the president of the Architectural League of New York uh, and a fellow of the American Academy in Rome. And with that, I leave you with Paul. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's a beautiful day, and apparently um, someone might be being indicted, so there's a lot of stuff going on, so I appreciate you being in, uh, in the hall today. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, what I think uh, is a kind of radical transformation that's being demanded of, uh, of buildings in general and of architects' agency relative to those buildings, largely having to do with the materials that we, we work from. Um, and it's both a kind of uh, significant transformation, but it's an exciting transformation and one that we're uh, very uh, invested in. But it, it, it involves a kind of rethinking of some of the basic premises that uh, have got Guided our practice for a while. Um, so we've been involved in adaptive reuse for many years. Uh, we enjoy working with existing buildings, uh, imagining their new future, whether it's an exterior art museum or in this case a, 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 a project in New York largely on the inside. Um, or retrofitting an existing uh, uh, science building at Cornell University that was built in the 1960s with almost no insulation. And so a lot of our effort went into rethinking the skin of the building, uh, thinking about it in terms of high performance, questions of environment, envelope, insulation, alignment with solar uh, energy essentially kind of a real focus on operational energy. And in a sense, we realized that, um, that we haven't been um, focusing necessarily on the right things. So for, for us, uh, the last couple of years have been a kind of uh, a moment of taking stock in what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and that resulted in an exhibition that if you happen to be walking on uh, a Makash walk over the past fall, you might have seen this sign saying biogenic house sections. There was an exhibition inside um, that we did and that's largely what I'm going to be presenting today. Um, it also happens to be a new seminar that I'm teaching. So our graduate students are, in a sense, thinking about how you can um, kind of consider the material basis of a building um, as a starting point for a, a, a site of invention, uh, in particular thinking about how we can build from plants. So the question is, why do we do this? And this is preaching to the choir, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, we know that, that global emissions are going in the wrong direction, current policy these are not sufficient and that um, in order to be able to get to a kind of point uh, without catastrophic consequences, we're going to have to reduce significantly the uh, carbon emissions, uh, global uh, greenhouse emissions. We know this, right? Um, that's not what I'm here to argue. Uh, what I'm trying to argue is what are the consequences on architecture? And we also know that buildings, and everyone claims that a certain amount of this uh, 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 carbon emissions is their responsibility. Um, the world of architecture likes to claim that uh, buildings account for 39% of this. This is not what I'm here to argue. Um, but it, it's simply to argue that yes, it, it, it's, a, it's a significant portion. 
And the problem is uh, a lot of the emphasis has been spent on the operational question. The energy used to heat a building, the efficiency, um, the kind of questions of what does it take to keep the lights on, those kind of questions. The problem is that as buildings have become more efficient in a weird way, we're spending more and more money on what could be called the upfront carbon. The amount of energy and the carbon associated with that with the actual making of the building itself. So that if, if you take a contemporary construction and play it out to 2050, the amount of carbon connected to that building, about half of that is from the upfront carbon to build the building to begin with. And it gets worse if you think about a high performance building because not only are you having a more efficient building which means you're not spending less and less on operational, but you're also probably spending more money on the skin, on the thickness of the insulation, all of the kind of things you need to do to get that high performance building. So that the, the amount of budget allocated to architectural, um, in a sense, carbon footprint is largely in the building itself. And that starts to change the kind of logic of how we have to approach buildings, particularly because this is in a sense, carbon that's bought up front. It's happening now, and so the, ener the amount of uh, operational carbon then accumulates over time, and we know that the carbon that occurs now is much more important than what will occur uh, across time. The other issue is that even though we've been very interested in adaptive reuse and kind of reusing existing buildings and we're fully invested in it, it's not gonna be enough to deal with the global demand of, uh, for new construction, which is estimated to be about, uh, you know, somewhere in the range of 2.5 trillion square feet of new buildings being requested, largely in the global south. So how do we do this? How do we attend to these, uh, these paradoxical incompatibilities? Um, we're also in a position where we're still dealing with the legacy of modernism. Working with glass, steel, concrete, highly uh, carbon intensive uh, 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 materials. Um, these are based not only on kind of linear extraction, but they also tend to have a lot of toxicity associated with their sites of extraction as well as their end of life. Um, so their environmental and human uh, health impacts of this approach to building. Um, and it also, from, from a position of uh, uh, thinking about what the role of architect is, you're essentially a kind of consumer. You're buying products, you're specifying products. Um, and so we'd argue that there's a, there's a really interesting moment now where thinking through buildings relative to plant and earth-based materials, we can not only kind of look towards lower carbon or if, uh, and possibly even sequestering carbon, but think about healthy buildings and the, in the kind of generative life cycles that may exist in, which embeds the building potentially in a kind of local uh, uh, ecology and economy, seeing the building not as being detrimental to health, but actually beneficial to health, not not just in terms of the building itself, but the site of where the materials are acquired from. And it positions the architect engaged in a lar larger expanse of where these materials come from, what do they do, not just uh, where do you buy them and how do you put them in the building. We know that uh, buildings are not equal, um, uh, sorry, materials are not equal in buildings. Um, so the top of this chart uh, of the, the embodied carbon by material are all metals, uh, glass, concrete, again, the materials of modernism. And it's the bottom end where uh, if you count the biogenic or the, uh, the, the bio-based carbon, uh, one can look at it potentially even as a, as a, as a form of sequestering. So we wrote uh, a, a, a new book that was just published a couple of months ago called The Manual of Biogenic House Sections. And the purpose here was to look at how plant-based materials could be a catalyst for um, not only beneficial approaches to, um, to climate and the environment, but also relative to invention in terms of what we think about a house to begin with. In other words, to not just simply think about materials, plant-based and earth-based materials, replacing existing materials and building the same houses, but actually rethinking the very nature of the buildings themselves. Um, in other words, how could design be a kind of catalyst or a point of seduction for the use of these materials by looking at the best houses from around the world uh, that are using these materials in inventive ways. Now, Without question, the house is a problematic type. Like one could argue that we shouldn't we shouldn't be building houses any longer. Um, in part because uh, you know they're not the right uh, model for dwelling on this planet. We should be looking at multi multifamily housing. The problem is if we're trying to argue for a radical change in these building materials, we have to have examples that are built. The best examples are in single family houses. They're where architects test out ideas often. So that's where we ended up gravitating as building type. Um, 
We also, as much as we would like to wish away houses, they're a dominant part of the, uh, of the building that is occurring worldwide. So how do we address this head on? The other thing that we were really, really interested in is looking at houses that kind of dealt with the problem of the expansive growth of houses. They've started, you know, if you look back to 2050, a, an average house was about 1,000 square feet. At least in the United States, that house is now 2,500 square feet. It's huge. So this ballooning up of houses is a problem. So all of the houses in the book are, are less than about 1,000 square feet, small houses, smaller footprint. Um, and then in the process, we also wanted to critique the, the fact that most of the materials in the, in the traditional uh, or contemporary uh, single family house in the United States are mostly petrochemical based. Um, they are toxic at their sites of extraction. They're toxic in terms of their impacts on human health inside the building. We've charted that within the book um, to try to look at the problems of the, of the kind of take, make, and then dump um, uh, associated with these materials. The other thing is more of a kind of architectural problem that we see ma being manifested within these thin, these thin uh, cheap uh, materials that you really now look at a wall of a house and it's a essentially a kind of invisible sandwich of multiple layers um, that are all aggregated together that are producing this lightweight, thin uh, collection of materials. They usually have a single purpose, weatherproofing, waterproofing, structure. They don't do more than that one thing, often for liability reasons on the part of their companies. And they produce this strict binary between interior and exterior. And from, a, from an aesthetic standpoint, you end up almost only focusing on the final thin veneer. So on the inside, it's all about the color of the paint. And on the outside, it's the siding. And everything in between is often under considered. But that's where the problem exists. So we, in the book, we're, we're much more interested in kind of thicker construction, mono construction, single materials that might do multiple things. Looking at thickness is actually a kind of site of delight, potentially. Um, ways to imagine. Um, uh, materials doing more things than simply being the, the site of aggregating of multiple tiny, thin, cheap petrochemical materials. Um, so these are all drawings that we did to try to index and classify the, the different types of, uh, of buildings. There were about 55 houses represented in the book. They were organized in chapters, each related to a different uh, uh, plant or earth-based material, with the 10th chapter of reuse uh, being added in as well. Each of the chapters kind of lays out the current understanding of the, the, the carbon uh, kind of footprint based on existing databases uh, about, uh, about these materials. We would then look at um, the kind of life cycle of these materials from the field or from where they were grown to how they would uh, be translated into the cycles of construction and demolition, and also how the specifics of that particular plant would be then um, molded or carved or cut or manufactured into existing products and what those products' consequences in, in the house or in the built form would be. Uh, each of the 55 houses is represented by both exterior and interior photographs. These are not well-known houses, so we wanted to make them legible to everyone. Uh, but we also wanted to show them construction photographs of how they went together, as well as an exploded axonometric that we drew. But the heart of the project, or heart of the book, really was this collection of cross-sectional perspectives that make legible the joints, the tectonic assemblies, how, in this case, wood framing was used to produce a very interesting uh, building type um, based on the, the, that particular material. Now, we spent about three or four years developing this book. Um, uh, and as architects, we got a little bit frustrated where we wanted to actually design, uh, design houses ourselves. So in parallel to that, this past summer, we designed five houses um, that we argue take seriously some of the materials and use them to invent different spatial and organizational premises for the house um, based on the idiosyncrasies of those materials. So I'm going to weave these two books, if you will, together um, for the rest of the presentation. And, and many of the houses, even though they were classified according to a particular material, they often exemplify multiple, uh, multiple materials. Um, and so in some ways, just for the organizational purposes, we've, we've used the chapters uh, to kind of frame a dominant material, acknowledging that it's usually the assembly of these different materials that makes for the interesting uh, attributes of the building. So 
Mass timber, um, cross-laminated timber, uh, has, in a sense, particularly in the architecture world, become a bit of the poster child for doing uh, plant-based buildings. Um, it's certainly better than concrete and steel, but it's not, uh, it's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna be the only solution. In part because there's a couple of problems with mass timber. Uh, namely, you're taking a tree out of the forest um, uh, that's taken a long time to grow. Um, you're disturbing soil. Um, the, the negative consequence of removing the tree probably exceeds the beneficial sequestering of the carbon. Rarely do you use more than about 50% of the tree when uh, in a typical uh, in a typical lumber factory. So even at that level, you're only sequestering half of the tree to begin with. So there's a limit to mass timber as being the single solution to uh, to our, our approach. Again, it's better than concrete and steel, but it has its has its limits. In addition, there's all kinds of uh, glues that are necessary to make most of the cross laminated timber. There's some interesting possibilities with dowel laminate and other mechanical fasteners but the adhesives are definitely uh, a point of concern. That being said, the, if you look at um, the possibility of mass timber, not again as a replacement for concrete or steel, which of course it can be, but as a new kind of tectonic form, there's ways to use this sheet good in really interesting um, um, possibilities. So Jennifer Bonner's uh, House Gables really looks at how that structural sheet good could actually produce very different uh, kind of domestic forms, things that could nest inside of each other, that they actually, unlike platform framing or other forms of uh, wood assembly. Here it's a fundamentally different approach to the skin as structure that can start to kind of configure organizational spaces in really interesting ways. Or a project in Finland uh, called the Meteorite, which produces this enigmatic figure, is in a sense uh, the intersection or the I should say the nesting really of two different um, skins or volumes of cross laminated timber, an exterior skin and an interior skin. The exterior is faceted, the interior is 90 degrees orthographic or, or geometrically uh, uh, regular. Um, and it's the interstitial space between the architect claims is, is a kind of an insulation space. We know there's convection cycles in here, there's problems in here, but it's an interesting argument to say that could you make an entire building that's just two layers of wood with the outer layer of wood just coated in uh, a stain to provide the waterproofing. Um, and in a sense, it assumes a certain degree of leakage and uh, that's part of the logic of the building. A really interesting project um, that is, is, is a very different way to think about how these materials could be used. So in a house we designed called um, CLT A-Frame House, where a lot of CLT is used as a, as a kind of given blank, you know, a 10 foot by 50 foot uh, sheet that then is cut with routers and you basically remove lots of materials. We kind of were curious about what would happen if you just accept the entire thing. You do use the whole 50 foot tall, uh, 10 foot wide blank and start to think about how these could be leaned into each other to produce a kind of an, a very, very tall A-frame building. Um, so the, the two, uh, two parallel um, um, panels at the back of the house would be laterally bra braced through a staircase. And as you move to the front of the house, each of the parallel panels start to get closer to each other, less parallel, if you will, uh, forming the iconic A-frame uh, at the other end. The roof is then as an, an accessible kind of roof deck that allows you to have a kind of view out towards the landscape um, uh, within this kind of elevated, quite high uh, treetop view, if you will. And of course, CLT, allows you to remove the gypsum wall board, removes the plaster, removes the paint, all of those kind of materials don't have to be added in and you can simply use the CLT as your interior finish. All right, so bamboo is, an, is a material that has great possibilities um, for, uh, for its structural um, capacity. Um, it grows much faster than wood, as we know, um, can be harvested through a kind of selective harvest as opposed to clear cutting. It's rhizomatic, so it grows uh, quite rapidly and can actually be uh, a, a really kind of interesting material. Um, it can be used as a full calm or bundled together in particular ways, but more often, and frankly, mostly it's used in architecture now for a kind of an interior finish by cutting it into a series of smaller scale strips and then re-gluing those strips together to form floors, partitions, panels, et cetera. Um, but it's often the kind of 
larger scale calm that, that produces some of the more interesting qualities. So in this house uh, in Ecuador, they effectively lash these single um, strands of bamboo into clusters that form this kind of lattice, uh, kind of diagonal brace um, that then almost allows the house to ramp up through these different levels. So as opposed to having a first floor and a second floor, here you get much more of a contiguous or a continuous uh, landscape, again, through the weaving together of these bamboo columns in a very different structure than stick framing uh, that we know with, uh, with two by four construction. Or in Anna Herringer's work uh, in a bamboo hostel, the bamboo is bent and stretched and forms this kind of uh, intricate weave of bamboo forms, uh, a kind of an unprecedented external skin and protective environment that then wraps itself around uh, a rammed earth core for, inter uh, for interior sleeping. Um, and really, the skin is dependent upon the flexibility and strength of bamboo. Um, so earth, although it kind of lacks the, um, the ability to work in tension, like, uh, like bamboo or wood, earth does have the capacity to be a load-bearing structure. It's one of the oldest building materials. It's ubiquitous. It's inexpensive. It's inherently local. Um, and its thickness can be worked as a thermal mass. It can absorb and balance humidity. Um, and if you use clay as the binder, as opposed to Portland cement, too often rammed earth is basically using Portland cement, um, you can have very low carbon emissions. Um, and it's kind of a fascinating material because it moves between a liquid and a kind of semi-solid state, can be formed into blocks uh, or uh, compressed into walls or even 3D printed into, into buildings. Um, so this particular uh, project, Von House Flory, actually works with 32 thick, uh, 30, 32 thick, uh, 32 inch thick L-shaped walls, cob walls, combination of straw and, uh, and loam or earth um, that's then just basically sheared with the spade. Um, and then the horizontal floor slabs uh, made with wood are then infilled with straw. So again, a kind of hybrid of different materials. Um, and it produces a very different as assembly of materials, which then requires the overhang of the roof to help protect against the erosion that would otherwise start to damage the, uh, the integrity of the exterior wall. Another project uh, in, uh, in Africa works with about 15,000 uh, four inch by eight inch by 16 inch uh, uh, earth block walls that are then used to form not only uh, uh, the walls themselves, but also into shallow vaults. Those vaults are then covered with a, a very thin um, corrugated metal to shed the water, protect against erosion, and also collect the water for, uh, for later use. And a 3D printed uh, house uh, uh, prototype uh, built outside of Bologna by Wasp, a uh, 3D printing company, uh, is really kind of fascinating use of the kind of weave, the slow printing. Uh, again, most 3D printing and architecture is occurring with concrete. We're trying to look at other models that are not having the kind of uh, carbon associated with it. So here is a fully earthen uh, base, non, uh, no Portland cement used in the, uh, the assembly of this structure. Um, but you get these interlacing of these skins of walls that produce hollow cavity that then is infilled with rice husks to produce the insulation. So for a project that we entitled the Lamella Earth House, we are looking at combining both bamboo and the kind of flexibility um, and the efficiency of bamboo as a kind of uh, vaulted uh, exterior envelope that then would nest inside of it an, an earthen structure embedded in the ground. So the exterior skin of this, uh, of this and it's really, so this is kind of a farmhouse, if you will. Um, uh, the exterior skin is uh, made out of eight foot lengths, self-similar lengths of bamboo with a single joint that forms a lamella structure. Um, one side of that lamella structure, the north side is clad in thatch, whereas the south side is a translucent uh, plant-based polycarbonate. So allowing, in a sense, producing a kind of interstitial space uh, that can be heated and cooled to mitigate some of the extremes of exterior temperature, effectively making a kind of modulated or modulatable greenhouse. And then the living quarters are actually located embedded in the ground on the lower left there, um, made from the local earth, stacked up, and really it's the kind of combination of these two that produces this um, more interesting gradient of how we might uh, produce thermal uh, opportunities within, within a house as opposed to a binary between interior uh, and exterior. And, and we were interested in the idea that this would form uh, a kind of uh, almost a farm uh, utility structure as well as a domestic space of the house. 
All right, the last three materials I'll present are, um, are essentially all primary uh, primarily used as insulation. And insulation is the thing that architects don't really wanna care that much about, to be honest with you. Um, I didn't really care that much about it. You needed to have it, you know, R50, R20, whatever the, the code is, and then you figure out the material, you, you find the cheapest one because it's usually not visible. And increasingly, the insulations that are on the market are incredibly toxic. They, they burn like you wouldn't believe and release amazingly unpleasant, nauseous fumes when they burn. And even when they're not burning, their entire life on this planet is one of toxicity. I mean, really, most plastic-based installations are really, really unpleasant. And ask any installer who has a, has a spray foam insulation, it's really not an enjoyable job. And that's just fundamentally wrong, right? So we have, we have, we're relying on this product because it's invisible for purely its performance characteristic, not realizing that it has all these other negative associations. So what are the, op what are the options within the plant-based world? So one of them is certainly hemp. Um, and Hemp is a fast-growing plant. Um, it was effectively um, kind of banned in the United States because of its, its, uh, its association with the war on drugs and its association with the, the, um, the uh, psychoactive uh, um, marijuana plant. Um, this is not, um, uh, not that. There's two different, um, two different plant types. Um, and hemp, I think, was just recently, uh, and I think the 2018 Farm Bill brought back in as a viable um, uh, plant to be, uh, to be grown agriculturally. Uh, it grows extremely quickly, about a foot per week, reaching maturity in about three months. Um, long root system aids in stability and regeneration of soil. There are people who are obsessed with, with hemp, and, uh, and, I, and I can see why. Um, it's resistant to uh, uh, insects. It tends to be fairly resistant to drought. Um, and it's, it's really the industrial hemp plant that has architectural purposes. Um, and the fibrous stalk, in effect, has to be removed from the uh, internal herd. And it's the herd that gets used for insulation. Um, these do require decorticators, um, machines that are going to separate these two uh, products. Uh, but hemp has, a, has many, many possibilities of being used. Um, and one of the nice things is that the herd is often the least valuable, and yet it's the best for insulation because of the fact that it has the air cavities built into it. Um, when it's combined with lime, um, it uh, can produce a durable, fire-resistant, rot-resistant, humidity-absorbing, and even acoustically beneficial insulating material. But it's not a replacement for concrete. I mean, there's a descriptions of hempcrete that somehow suggest it's gonna replace concrete. It's not a load-bearing structure. Uh, I don't like the term hempcrete because it suggests that it's a replacement for concrete, which, which it isn't. But it can be used to fill walls as insulation, um, whether it's sprayed on or compacted into an existing wall. Can be used to be, one of the downside to hemp is it takes a while to dry um, with the lime. So prefabricated panels off site can deal with that, or even working with kind of pre pre made um, blocks. Um, so hemp has, has great potential. Another um, uh, plant based material that would be ideally if it could grow around the world rapidly is cork. Cork is fantastic. Um, it, uh, its only real limit is that it, it, it's, uh, it, it's slow to grow, it's harvested off trees, um, and it can only be grown in certain regions. But it's amazing. It's water resistant, provides thermal um, benefits, it's antifungal, it has acoustic. Some people love the smell of cork. I happen to like the smell of cork quite a bit. Uh, and it even has structural capacities. So um, most of it is, is harvested in the Iberian Peninsula, and most of the cork used in building products today is derived from the excess of the wine bottle, bottle stopper industry. So it's also recyclable, so it's, it, it has great potential, and there's some really interesting examples of houses that are made entirely out of cork, right? Um, so this wall, the skins, the structure, almost all of this house, with the exception of, of a couple of, uh, of lateral bracing uh, kind of ring beams, um, the entire house is made out of about 1,300 CNC mill blocks, uh, blocks of cork, uh, stacked up to produce the entire project. Um, the last material is straw, and we're, I'm super interested in straw. Um, it's in part because it's, it's ubiquitous. It's, it, you can get it around the world, and more importantly, unlike even hemp, which has to be purpose-grown, 
Straw is effectively a waste product from agriculture. There's massive amounts of, of carbon that is, in a sense, um, being extracted from the atmosphere to produce straw now that simply goes back to the atmosphere through burning, uh, through just basically letting it uh, decompose. And straw is available. It's cheap. Um, it's readily available everywhere. Um, and it has really good insulating capacities. Um, it grows fast, as I mentioned. Uh, it can be resistant to rot. Um, and if it's actually compressed enough, it can actually work as a load-bearing structure. Um, so the, um, there are kind of two ways that straw is translated into a building material. One is through um, kind of thatch or kind of harvesting of reeds. It's a slightly different uh, uh, type of straw. But the more common way is through baling. Um, and a lot of uh, straw bale-based projects have been based on the assumption that these things exist ready-made, two-string or three-string bales. Um, and these things have been stacked up into building form since uh, the late 1800s in Nebraska, where there was a, uh, an absence of trees or wood. So straw became a kind of source for building material. Uh, and they still exist. So they, you know, despite anxiety about the three little pigs and the straw being the weakest one of the three, straw actually has great um, durability. And when coated with plaster, it can actually be uh, resistant to rot, fire, mold, etc. cetera. Um, has to be carefully done, but certainly it it's, uh, has, has great possibility. Um, can also be uh, prefabricated into panels, and as I mentioned, be used as thatch. One of the most interesting examples that we came across is uh, by Atelier Smith, and here they were working with jumbo bales. These are really large bales. They're approximately 30 inches by 50 inches by 100 inches, 650 pounds each, and these do work as load-bearing. They're su sufficiently heavy, sufficiently compressed that this is a load-bearing structure. Um, so this building basically stacked up these, uh, these straw bales into this quarry uh, um, this, this uh, corbelled uh, vaulted ceiling, if you will, um, in a sense making a, a super thick insulating and structural blanket around, uh, around this uh, domestic space. And it contains 75 metric tons of agricultural waste as a result, which sequesters about 84,000 uh, kilograms of CO2 uh, um, within, within the building itself. Um, we were, as architects, really interested in this idea that you would get thickness, and thickness would be generative to the architectural project. So in the last two projects I'll present, which are just house projects, work with this idea of straw um, as both a kind of load-bearing material, but also a kind of thickness that could change our relationship to how we even think about the status of the wall. Um, so in this particular project, the kind of uh, uh, the straw um, and CLT spiral house, we are interested in how the CLT or the cross-laminated timber could be used to make prefabricated four-sided modules, in a sense, rooms. And those rooms could then exist within void spaces within an otherwise thick volume of, uh, of jumbo bales. So in a sense, prefabricating the space, carving out the void from the straw, and then placing the room within the thickness of the wall. There'd be a central space down the middle. There would be a kind of an atrium that would bring in light from a skylight above. Um, the roof overhanged, uh, extended over the sides of the building to protect the, the plaster skins against erosion uh, and also provide um, better shading, uh, particularly in the summer. And then in a sense, the house was just the spiral of these voids that worked around the volume uh, or the volume of the straw. So you'd essentially be able to enter into the building up the stair, move between the dining room up to the bedrooms and up to the terrace. So in effect, you get this building that's both porous and thick simultaneously, um, has a lot of light and air, but there's a kind of coordination where every single room has a picture window, and yet you get thick insulative, um, uh, high, uh, relatively high performing walls that sequesters a high amount of carbon. The last house is the mass straw house, and this is uh, intentionally a play on the idea of mass timber. Um, so the mass straw house looked at two different ways to assemble straw into architectural form. One is to produce it as a long wall that you could corbel and stack the um, uh, straw into a linear element. Um, and the other was to kind of aggregate the straw into a thickness that would then rest against the hillside. Uh, these two uh, kind of assemblies of straw would be tied together 
by a roof structure that it, uh, a wood roof structure that would, in a sense, stiffen the two of them against each other and then be infilled with straw. And we like the idea that the top layer of the straw uh, would actually be left to rot, if you will, return back to the earth uh, so that you could have animals that could feed on the roof of the building. There's this anxiety that somehow building in straw means that animals are going to eat our houses. And we're like, well, maybe that's not such a bad idea if we can kind of coordinate it in a very, very specific way. Um, there's something really pleasurable about the idea that the building over time does start to fuse back to the earth in a very uh, calibrated and intentional way. Whereas on the inside, the idea here is that the, the space between these two walls is, um, is the kind of social space, the dining room, the kitchen, the kind of living room uh, with these different terraced uh, landscapes. So you're not just limited to a single floor plate, um, but you can access back into the bedrooms and the bathroom into the thickness of this, uh, into the thickness of the straw, have this kind of moment of privacy, uh, often uh, using skylights to bring light into this. But we like the idea very much that more of this house is actually straw than it is space. It's a very different relationship to the efficiency of modernism, but achieves uh, certain qualities that modernism uh, avoids. Um, so just to conclude, we, you know, we, we believe that this is a significant transformation to the material basis of our, our built environment. Um, which also, from our standpoint, um, expands the role of the architect to embrace the, the full life cycle of materials. Uh, and I, we are optimistic um, and enthusiastic about this necessary and fascinating way that plant and earth-based uh, buildings might change the future uh, of, of where we live and how we inhabit the earth moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. That was fascinating. I want the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, I'm going to open for questions. So the tradition is that if students have questions first, please go ahead. And we have a mic somewhere. I can give mine, too. Hi, uh, super interesting work. Um, I do have a question about like how do you sell the whole idea in terms of someone who's not really interested in carbon emissions and they think about the maintenance of all of these natural materials. So this person's gonna think like, oh, I'm gonna have to change the cladding, I'm gonna have to change these things from time to time, or it's gonna start accumulating dust like on the bamboo that is like woven. Uh, so in terms of maintenance and selling this to someone who's not really interested in the main concept. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It raises two different, there are two different ways to think about that. One is to, there are ways, and certainly straws being used to embed into existing wall assemblies that are then clad in very conventional materials. You can fill a wall with straw and clad it with vinyl siding if you want, not that I would encourage that, um, but you can do that. Um, so in other words, there can be a distinction about the material and its, and its, and its position within the assembly. So, and that's, that's certainly one of the arguments that is being made, that we can, we can go down this path of substitution. We can kind of selectively use these materials in particular ways. And that has, that has some uh, possibility. Um, uh, I, actually, there are three answers. The other is to look at ways that these materials don't necessarily require any more maintenance um, uh, without re resorting back to siding that is designed precisely because it's maintenance free. So um, that's a little bit harder to do, um, but there, I think there are ways to think about um, skins. And a good example would be, we can look at working with bark as a cladding as opposed to vinyl siding, right? It's actually quite durable. And um, the third answer, which I think is probably the more important answer, is that 
The assumption that buildings are maintenance free is I think a false myth that is propagated by people who want to sell plastic based products. And most of those products then deteriorate even though they may have not required a maintenance, right? Ask anybody with vinyl siding, it looks pretty crappy after 10, 15 years. Maybe it was maintenance free because you didn't have to paint it. So based on the previous model, it was a little better. But um, I think that the idea that buildings require maintenance and therefore we should think about that maintenance be, as being beneficial as opposed to negative. The question then is who does the labor? So there's a lot of associate problems with that. But I do think that we've gotten it, you know, particularly the building industry has been so fascinated by maintenance free as, a, as somehow a selling point that it's then justified all of these layers of which none of them are truly maintenance free. They may be maintenance free through their life, but then they die and then you throw them out. So, you know, what happens if we think about a small amount of maintenance that's gonna keep something going for a duration of its entire life, for our lifetime, for thousands of years. So I think it's a question of a conceptual logic of how we think about the role of buildings. And I would argue all buildings require maintenance, embrace it and think how that maintenance could actually be beneficial and not seen as detrimental. So it's a great question. So. Yeah. Hi, um, I just have a question about the, you know, the, the job of structural engineers making this transition happen. So what has been your experience in proposing this or yeah alternative materials to structural engineers do they panic do they like it no yeah, um well i you know in some ways um cross laminated timber is the one that's worked its way through the um codes through um through the various bureaucratic apparatuses to be able to be legitimate and that was dependent upon the, uh, the kind of excitement and intelligence of structural engineers to move that forward. Um, I think that, um, I don't see that as so much a problem. Um, there, uh, in part because wood is so fundamental to so many different forms of, uh, of construction. I think the trickier thing is when you start to get into things that are harder to calibrate. And um, so straw is a good example, right? Um, and I would argue that one of the one of the interesting but also difficult problems we have at the moment is that we're at the super early stages of how you might consider these materials. Um, so for example, I'm not convinced that straw bale is the, necessarily the right way to go. We need to think about how we could form straw into building assembly parts that themselves could have clearly designated performance ca capabilities, right? They have this compression. You know, they're built for that way. Straw bales are bound because they're efficient for the farmer, not for the building industry, right? So, um, and if you look back to the origins of, of say, um, reinforced concrete, the first 10 years of reinforced concrete were not so great, right? So it's not, so in other words, the need to kind of invest uh, design and engineering intelligence into these materials has to happen quickly and not just assume that the current state of straw and hemp is here and that somehow we have to evaluate that against, you know, hundreds of years of innovation with steel and concrete, right? So um, I don't know if I'm getting at your question, but I think it's, okay. Um, it's, I would argue that, that yes, there are, the, the materials need to advance quickly. Um, and one of the reasons why we picked buildings that existed is because we didn't, we wanted to be able to make a book about things that have been built, that are standing, that are there, not a kind of future possibility, in part because this has to scale really quickly. <laughs> um, and so it's got to be based on proven examples, not possibilities of what might happen. So. Hello. Um, I guess I'm curious as to how much of the research that goes into, I guess, the nine sections and also like the 10th chapter were based off the um, like uh, existing techniques for home building from like, let's say, wood, uh, not wood, mud built homes or, or I guess like the th straw thatched roofs and like this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so one of the criteria that we had for the book um, is, how do I put this in a way that doesn't sound, that sounds optimistic, not cynical. Um, we wanted to make an argument that 
that working with these materials wasn't a return to the 19th century, that it wasn't inherently a return to um, known practices that are maybe pre-industrial, which is not to say those aren't fascinating, but our interest was how could they be used to imagine different ways of, uh, of, of designing a house. So all of the projects we picked, we, we picked because they had what we call a kind of architectural seduction. They were arguing for something different than reconstituting known vernacular models. Um, and that was hard, right? Because I think that some of the best um, versions of uh, many of these houses in terms of their, um, say, their duration that they've existed, um, the knowledge built into them come from, uh, from uh, vernacular traditions. But we were trying to find a way that you know, the role, we argue that one of the things that architects do is bring seduction into the mix and make demand higher because of that. So is there a way that houses that are based on plants are not returning to 19th century, but actually moving even forward into a better future? And what is that future? So that seduction is important, frankly, for the, for the, 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 the need to make this um, embraced by effectively a consuming society, right? So um, that was, but it's, it's a really good question, so. I have a few questions from um, online sure. participants. So I'm going to bundle them up. Two are very similar. It's about how um, those various building materials and techniques hold up against uh, natural hazards compared to other conventional techniques. So they mention earthquake, freezing, tornadoes, high wind, big storms, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, again, I think that the, um, it's hard to answer that um, relative to all the materials. Certainly wood frame and cross laminated timber have had a long history of kind of being flexible and, and, and having a kind of structural um, redundancy to, uh, to make them work. I think one of the things where things get to be, I'm, I'm super fascinated in straw, but I also recognize that one of the limits is earthquake and lateral forces and a lot of the work in terms of the, if it, if it is load bearing, and obviously you can embed straw around an existing wood frame structure, that's quite common. But if you try to look at straw being load bearing, then the skins become really important and do they have the capacity? Straw is built in now into the California code uh, and is accepted by California code with its seismic requirements with very specific meshes and cladding. So it has been embraced already and been tested out for that. Um, and again, because hemp is basically an insulation, it's not really gonna be part of that system anyways. That's gonna be your, your, your framing systems that are gonna do that. Um, so the short answer is that the, they're already proven to perform in different ways. Um, but I, I, one of the interesting questions, and it brings back to the kind of question of how do we look at other models? How do we bring the structure? How do we bring those questions in to actually generate different ways to think about how we use these materials? And um, I'm going to lump together another question with maybe an opening, also a, a question from me. So. One of the questions is about how can we use those um, alternative ways, I mean, or ways that you're describing, um, thinking about a transition that is both ecological but also socially just. And the person mentioned the fact that those type of straw, mud, have been used in um, South America, for instance, for people to build their own home on their own. Um, and I guess the link to my own question would be how, what timeline do you see to upscale this, you know, at larger scales? Like, what, what is the timeline you think is feasible? Yeah, I mean, I would argue that, that the need to think about prefabrication is going to be crucial to scaling, but shouldn't be done in a way to take away from the very local construction DIY that's also possible, right? So for me, the interest is how do you combine those two together? Um, and one of the really... I mean, one of the kind of fantastic things about earth-based materials is they are local. They often do have a tradition of DIY. Of, um, and so how do we find a way that, given the difficulty of scaling that, not everyone wants to build their own house, how do you find a way to embrace both that capacity plus also recognizing that's not going to be the sole approach to scale. In fact, that may be the resistance to scale, right? So, um, so it's kind of an, an all of the above. But the part that to me is, is kind of missing is the way in which materials need to work their way into production streams, into kind of construction, I mean, factories, to be blunt, uh, to make products 
Um, but to try to do that, that doesn't assume you're transporting materials all around the world, right? So to combine the local traditions with local factories to produce buildings that are appropriate for local areas, um, but not see one as the, the kind of problem, not see one as an, a hindrance to the other. Another question? Can I follow on from that? One of your early slides showed that most of the housing is going to be in the global south. A lot of that's the tropics. So you've got termites and other issues and poverty. So the cost effectiveness and the modularity, what sorts of materials would you lean towards in the global south, building more apartments rather than single standalones? How do you use then the structure of one to buffer the structure of the other? And what materials would go against termites and flooding and things like that? Yeah, no, it's really good. I mean, things get trickier as humidity levels go up. I mean, I think there's no question about that. So, um, and, you know, I think that, that, that the materials that are currently or have been used, um, I think b bamboo has great, great capacity. Um, and I also think that there are way, there are, I should also say that there are other materials that we didn't look at um, that, you know, uh, coconut husks that can be woven into material and there's there's agricultural waste projects that we're not even touching right so this is probably probably the best way to answer that is to acknowledge my limited knowledge <laughs> and to say that actually the fascinating possibility is actually I would argue is in the world of agricultural waste um, and how that could be and then that also builds on materials that are already resistant so what yeah about the mixture of the and yeah absolutely Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Without question. I think a combination of um, agricultural waste, reed-based, bamboo, fast-growing, with the with the ability of working with adobe and the local clays. No, no question about that. So. Yeah. Thank you. Fascinating talk. So you started this uh, your talk with. Uh, so, so in the U.S., the, our sense of ski, uh, ski, houses are growing uh, in size. You know, I look at these houses while I say these look really cool. I'd love to have one of these. I, you know, how do we how do we accelerate these concepts into the mainstream? We're still building center hole colonials in this country, horribly inefficient homes. We've had efficiency technologies for years, and no one's building it. So, how do you get this from off the drawing board into the you know, the culture, it seems to be a cultural issue in this, at least in this country. And we have to be a leader for the world if you, if you, if I think oh, this is yeah. all going to pan out. I don't have an answer to that. I mean, my, my, I mean, it's, it's the, 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 um, I mean, the, the simple answer is architects are um, responsible for what, like 2% of buildings in this country? I mean, so the already, I think that one, one, one the only lever that I see is both through um, a kind of belief in people's acknowledgement of the problem and an alignment between that acknowledgement and some form of seduction where they get excited by what might be possible. And also, I, I, I would argue that the more knowledge about the toxicity associated with the way in which our buildings are built, that for me is something people take very personally. So um, the health and wellness of the individual when it's clearly connected to the, the carpets, the paints, I mean, we basically live in plastic buildings. Like, we line our entire house with plastic, latex paints, you know, uh, vinyl flooring. It, we, we're, we're inhabiting this world that's basically killing us. <laughs> and that, I think, can be used as a lever to, to rethink other models. But there have to be other seductive alternatives out there to be able to make that possible, that leap possible. So uh, just to follow up on that a moment, I mean, I think one met, and then I have a, a question. I think one way to think about this issue is government incentives, mm -hmm. okay? So one can go and have conversations with people about how, the, how their houses are, are filled with things that might, might cause them health problems, and if they're not experiencing them, it, 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 I don't think it'll go anywhere. I mean, that's true with sort of adoption of any new technology or idea. But if there are government incentives to get things started and then investors can see a path that they can make money, that's how it works in this country, okay? Yeah. In terms of, of it, any, anyway, okay. My question to you, 
It was a great talk, by the way. Thank you, Paul. Um, it, my question to you is um, thinking about the life cycle and the life, and I wonder how much of what you've done in these two books thought about the life cycle, did somehow a life cycle analysis to think about um, not just the actual plant uh, and, and the use of and the processing of the plant and the use of it and how much CO2 it's absorbing in the plant, but there are other inputs like water, mm -hmm. right? And just the, and the energy in terms of processing and all of that. And I was just wondering, First of all, you know, is that part of the analysis in some way? And secondly, I was really struck by what you said about timber, that 50%, only 50% of a tree is being used. We should be working toward, you know, just like you said with the agricultural waste products, of course, forestry waste products, such that every piece of something that has carbon in it is being utilized, right? And so I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. And, um, and in particular, the other thing I was thinking about from your talk was about, I'm sorry, it's, it's, I hate it when people have more than one point, so, but I just have to get it out there. Um, and that is, to me, it seems that, the, that what's crucial is that we be using products that grow fast. Because right, right. that's going to absorb as much carbon as possible. So that means hemp, straw, bamboo, right? right? Could we, and so can we envision a world where we find very clever ways to build our structures, including multifamily structures like you brought up, with those three materials? Yeah, um, all really good points. And we did not do a meticulous calculation of all of the inputs in all these houses. We even struggled to even count the A1 through A3 carbon of eight of the houses. And even that we know we're wrong, but we needed to do it to provide an exam exa examples, right? Um, uh, the, and, and as a bit of a side, one of, the, one of my anxieties is the degree to which life cycle assessment can get so complicated, it can become a, a hurdle to people engaging it. Like, when it gets, it, and, and, and the impossibility of being precise and the demand to try to be as precise sets up a paradoxical problem where people just won't do it. Architects won't do it. The industry is not going to do it. And, but yet it's fundamental. So it's this weird kind of thing. But, um, so even when we did this book, we were trying to say, how do we assess the carbon? We know there's so many problems with this that we, we're not even, even going to be right, but it's better to try it than to be, to not, not engage it. Um, even A1 through A3. Um, and to acknowledge the uncertainties. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, great. Yeah, and to your last point is absolutely, I think that the combination of bamboo as a structural capacity, hemp as an insulation, straws and insulation, but potentially also load bearing, um, how you could combine with the, the faster growing, the things that don't replace crops, that don't extract, or, you, know, you know, damage forests that should be kind of left alone if at all possible, except, you know, there's, not a whole issue on that. Absolutely. And then that becomes a kind of question of what are the ways that we have to invent different ways to think about these materials? And that's really where there's, there needs to be this investment in R&D now to try to figure out how to do it. Because the models we know uh, that are local traditions are tough to scale and tough to um, deal with the aesthetic associations with those, however delightful we might find them, right? So. Um, but anyway, this is a really good point, so. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm just going to announce, um, so next month, our fourth and last speaker of the spring for the HMEI faculty seminar series will be Emily Carter uh, from the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and the Enlinger Center. And uh, she will talk about sustainable production of fuels and chemicals insights from the atomic scale. Um, so I hope to see you there in a month. Thank you again, Paul. Thank you.